Catlett Station and more Black Confederate spies. In Lee's Black Spy, my last video, we saw evidence that a 19 or 20 year old black man from New Orleans brought Confederate cavalry information that allowed them to get the advantage of ter terrain at Trevilian Station to such an extent that 6,000 Confederate cavalrymen stopped and then defeated a force of almost 10,000 Union cavalry. In that video, we also looked at evidence to suggest that this may have well been the same man that led Stuart to Pope's headquarters at the Battle of at the Catlett Station Raid in 1862. In this video, we are going to look at evidence suggesting that he was not an outlier or a fluke, that there were a number of black Confederate agents, espionage operatives, and that their contribution to the Confederate military in battle was so significant that the veterans chose to put them on this memorial in Arlington Cemetery in their rightful place, where any good scout should be, in the background. In other videos, we're going to look at their role in the Navy and in logistics, and maybe even one at their actual combat role. However, this one is just going to concentrate on espionage. During the Spanish-American War in the 1890s, the Confederate military united with the Union military to create the United States military. Here we have the section of Lee's property that they were given, and they erected apparently the largest statue there that the Frez that we just looked at, you know, the relief statue, the little pictograph, was is here at this most sacred site. The man who made it was Moses Jacob Ezekiel. He was one of the most celebrated sculptors of his day, his work appearing in civic spaces, art museums, and universities across the world. Born in Richmond to a family of Spanish Jewish origin, Ezekiel was the first Jewish cadet to attend the Virginia Military Institute and fought at the Battle of Newmarket with the other cadets. No, they didn't really get out in the field and do a lot of marching, but they did do some dying. So he was certainly in a position to know what had happened. The man who actually commissioned and designed or approved the design was Samuel Lee Lewis, medical doctor, and this was in 1904. Dr. Lewis was an assistant surgeon with the Army of the Confederacy during the American Civil War. After the war, he resumed, resumed his medical practice in Washington, D.C. in America. He was elected commander of the Charles Broadway Rouse Camp, number, nine, number 1191 of the United Confederate Veterans. In other words, all these men were there and they fought. These were not just a bunch of daughters who came up with the idea later. Espionage. It covers the activities of the officers who assign the spies, coordinate the scouts, send the couriers, and find guides and informants, and oversee operations like safe houses and stable that are run by operatives. Of course, each of these has its opposite, double agent spies and people who screen the scouts and people who intercept the couriers, and of course, you've got false guides and false informants and counter espionage operatives. We'll look at some of those in a minute. Okay, the first one is Rosser's Spy. That's the one that we looked at last time in Lee's Black Spy. I just call him Shango for lack of a better word. That's the African God of the Storm. Now, was Stuart's contraband also Shango? We'll look at that, but he was definitely a guide. William Chapman and Elisa Corsi, Eliza Corsi, were both officers who coordinated their own little operations. Then you have Holt Collier and James Nolan. I put Collier above Nolan because I think his work did more good for the Confederacy, but John Nolan may have been just as good a spy. Okay, then we got Josie Haslett. She's an informant. And then we have a Louisiana scout, like the first two or one. I don't know who he was, but he's definitely there. And then we're going to look at Martin Robinson. He may or may not have been a spy. He was serving as a guide or a false guide. And then Conrad, in, Captain Conrad in his book, Rebel Scout, talks about men he hired for cash for short clandestine operations. Those were Conrad's guides. 
This is a map of the Kallet Station raid. In Lee's Black Spy, I showed the conflict in the primary sources between what Captain Benjamin Stringfellow of the 4th Virginia Cavalry said in his lectures. The 4th Virginia Cavalry Company E was a complete company of scouts and secret agents that included Redmond Burke and Farley and another couple notables. However, in Stewart's official report, he makes it clear that he was led by a young Negro that night. Many of the other soldiers also reported a Negro leading Stewart 156 years ago tonight, August 22, 1862. This is where he had to lead them through the middle of three Union armies. As daring as Stewart was, he wasn't suicidal. He had to trust not only the black man's loyalty and commitment, but he had to trust his sense of direction as well in the dark for 10 miles in the middle of a driving thunderstorm along country forested roads. Uh, they couldn't have torches, it was raining too hard, and they certainly weren't carrying lanterns or would have given away their position. This is a little closer view to show that the 10 miles is conservative. Over Cedar Run through the wooded country roads, it might have been closer to 15 miles from the point where he was captured at Warrington. Okay, I think, mind you, think Stringfellow sent him, okay, that he had just traveled the route and that he knew the positions of the Union Army in real time, like where their pickets and their cavalry redettes and the patrols were. And of course, this would give Stuart significant confidence, sufficient confidence to take the Union Army headquarters in what otherwise could have been nothing but a harebrained scheme. Okay, this is a gamer's map. It's not really good. I'm trying to find something that showed the terrain. It's a recovered woods all the way to the depot. Okay, Pope was visiting his army that night where he should have had his headquarters. But after the falling out with McClellan in the War Department, Pope felt that staying in constant contact with Stanton was a priority. He returned to a vacant lot. Stuart, Roger, and the Laurel Brigade had packed off everything. The next morning, Lee knew more about Pope's latest position than Pope did. The Union Army of Virginia was paralyzed while Lee moved rapidly. Second Manassas was basically kind of an anticlimax after that. Okay, back to Lee's spy just one more time. We looked at all the evidence in the first one, the first video. So this is kind of getting into speculation to consider the connections between the Callet and Trevelyan raids uh, besides the one with Rosser or Roser. Okay, you're going to have to excuse me. I speak Texas, Louisiana, and racetrack jargon. I know it's confusing, kind of like Valet and Valet, but I try. Okay, if the black spy had been lying or just wrong, he could have doomed the Confederate cavalry that day at Trevelyan, but neither Hampton nor Rosser seemed to have considered that a possibility. This act tells me that he'd done something earlier to prove himself, and I think that was Catless. But I could, there could be two of them, but even if there is two of them, this is still two battles two, that you can chalk up to black Confederates. Conrad here wrote one of the two reports that confirmed the existence of Lee's black spy. But he talks about a number of blacks who worked for him in his role as Washington station chief for the Confederate Cavalry Intelligence Service. Most were guides or boatmen who took him on clandestine operations for like $10 gold, which is at least 500 now, if not more, because the greenback fluctuated wildly throughout the war. Okay, they took his money and kept their mouth shut. In particular, we're about to look at Bill Chapman. Um, the first picture is uh, of him when he graduated from Dix Dickinson College in Pennsylvania in late 1850s. One of him is during the war, and the last is from post-war when he was head of Virginia A&M, which is now Virginia Tech. Apparently, he could grow a lot of beard and used it to regularly alter his appearance. In this, Conrad is talking about his plot to kidnap Lincoln. I'm going to start here with the second paragraph. My Negro man, William, who had been with me for months, was part Indian and part African. His mother was a mulatto woman and his father was an Indian. 
He was six feet in height, straight as an arrow, 23 years of age, and when with me, bold as a lion, having fought at my side in more than one affair. His loyalty to me and the cause I served was not questioned. I wanted him on this occasion to mount the seat upon which Mr. Lincoln's driver sat, and with pistol in hand, faithfully to take him, you know, take over the carriage and drive it away. Okay, this is a little earlier in the book and earlier in the war. Conrad hasn't told us yet that William is like not white, but the object here is to get back into the city because this is August and early is making his raid from the north and he's gonna to try to get inside and do whatever damage he can and help him from the inside. So we're gonna start here at the second sentence. It was early in the night when we landed and I directed my oarsmen to remain for a couple of hours and I would be through with William, my valet, and he could return with them. I told William I wished him to go ahead and locate the Yankee pickets and then return and point to me the direction of the post, etc. And that if he were captured, he could not be detained as he was a contraband and had only to tell them he lived in the neighborhood and was on his way to the store and post office. William started off at a lively pace and I followed at long range. It was not long before the pickets were located and the post discovered. William returned and gave me the points and retraced his steps to the boat, while I flanked both the pickets and post and pressed into the interior. And soon on the same old gray horse at TB, rode over the Navy Bridge into the city. The clans, you know, his operation was summoned. And the question was, is Washington in any condition to resist attack? The unqualified answer was no. Okay, Grant had pulled all the heavy artillery away from the city and most of the infantry too. Just all they had were a few militia made up of clerks and secretaries. So if they early had got there earlier, they could have probably taken the city. Okay, this is a little bit later in the war. Uh, things had gotten so hot for Conrad in Washington that he's now working counter espionage out of Richmond and they're looking for a courier system that's helping the escaped prisoners get away and taking messages to the Washington. So he has it printed in the newspaper that two federal officers have escaped and he had two of his operatives to pose as those officers. Starting on the second paragraph, the bait was swallowed with avidity. The federal officers were promptly taken in supped and given a guide to the gunboats on the Potomac. The guide was the Negro suspect. With this guide, the two federal officers bid adieu to the good lady who had entertained them and told the old gentleman of Northern birth who had cheerfully given them the information and left after nightfall afoot, on the, afoot for the gunboats on the Potomac. William and myself followed the tree on horseback and learned the route from beginning to end. When the supposed federal officers entered the cabin of the Negro, William and myself dismounted and with pistol in hand, entered after them and made this trio our prisoners. Will you, William, by my order, took charge of the Negro and I took charge of the two officers and together we retraced our steps to the Rappahannock. The officers told me of all that had happened and sending them to the quarters I had selected for them, I joined William with the Negro prisoner. Upon reaching the Rappahannock River, we dismounted and tied our horses and walked down to the water's edge. The Negro, seeing a boat at hand and supposing that we intended to put him in it and take him across on his way to Richmond, wrenched himself free from the grasp of William and started at full speed along the sandy beach. In a trice, William fired, and I followed with another shot, and down the Negro went with a groan. Upon examination, I found that William's shot had entered his back just below the left shoulder blade, in other words, in the heart, and that mine had struck and entered the neck at an angle to the jaw, jawline. William picked up the body and carried it to the river and pitched it in and the river freezing some six inches thick that night and remaining so for many weeks. 
never floated to the surface the lifeless body of Peter Ware. The following day, I joined the two officers at their quarters to hear all that particulars of their story and the Jade Mansion and the Rappahannock. They confirm my suspicions in toto. Thereupon, I made a report in full to the Secretary of War and asked permission to deal with all the parties involved in, this, in parties involved in a way my judgment dictated. He broke up the spy ring. He never did get all the way to crazy blue, but he messed up the courier system and made it difficult for her to send messages out. The most famous Confederate spy is probably Maria Isabel Boyd, La Belle Rebelle, Belle Boyd. To call her flamboyant is an understatement. Frankly, she wasn't cut out for espionage work, but Elisa clearly had a talent for it. She saved Belle regularly and was the one who got the information out, which is, like I said before, is that's really the hard part getting couriers and hidden compartments to get it to the people in time for it to be any good. The war started early for them, being in Martinsburg, right on the Maryland line. It was occupied by federal forces in 61. It started in earnest for these high school girls when Bell shot and killed a drunken soldier who had intruded into their home and threatened her mother, apparently killing him with one shot. El Elisa wasn't generally impressed with the Union Army for many reasons, most of which were personal rather than philosophical. I'll let you draw your own conclusion about these two ladies from these separate accounts. Realizing her feminine power and having mastered the art of flirting, Belle knew that she could fly under the radar of suspicion and through family connections began gathering information from Union soldiers. With the help of Elisa, Bell would send the information to the Confederate side. When one of her letters was intercepted, Bell was arrested but managed to get off with a warning for a crime that was punishable by death. In another account, Bell seemed to come out of the womb a rebel. At the age of 10, Bell defied her social status and the law by teaching Eliza Corsi, one of her family's slaves, to read and write. Bell and Elisa had become fast friends growing up together and Bell wanted Eliza to have enjoyed some of the same rights denied her by her color. She later states in her memoir, Bell Boyd in Camp and Prison, published in 1865, Slavery, like all other imperfect forms of society, will have its day, but the time for its final extinction in the Confederate States of America has not yet arrived. Okay, if you ask me from what I saw, or see, Elisa was the brains of the outfit. She got other slaves to carry the messages, whether they knew what they were doing or not. We can only speculate. However, what those two ladies were up to as partners in crime, I think I'd like to make an example here. These are four of my six granddaughters, your cousins. The uh, two on the far end look a little chagrined because the big one had just come in and busted them playing games on their her phone. The one in the end couldn't talk yet, but she liked playing games on the phone because she wasn't supposed to be playing games on the phone. Because the other two, we have no clue what they were doing outside, but they were terribly pleased with themselves when they got back and they just didn't really want to talk to us about it. Okay, this is another lady at Josie Haslett, okay, from Spies of the Confederacy by John Blakeless. Meanwhile, Federal Calvary, alert Calvary, alerted by Union sympathizers at the house he had first visited were searching every dwelling house by house. Before Stringfellow could get away, the Hazlitt house was surrounded. But a quick-witted Negro maid, Josie, took him to the attic, where from, her wind went from a window a board protruded, and this hidden by the roof on the porch. On this, the fugitive lay, while Josie obligingly helped the searchers. Volubly, I mean, that means talkative, I had to look it up. The Negro girl explained, though with subtle vagueness, Yes, she had seen a man, or at any rate, she thought she had seen a man. He had run off through the garden, or it seemed to, though she wasn't quite sure. Here is a little girl playing dumb, acting like she's really flattered by all the attention, and is running off at the mouth. She's playing them. She's got them fooled, but, you know, that's kind of what young ladies do. This is Holt Collier, uh, 
first one is kind of, you know, you see what he looks like. And the second one, if you got it, you're doing a story on a cavalryman, you got to find a picture of him on a horse if there is one. And this third picture is of him with his Confederate veterans uniform later in life. In his own words, he begged like a dog to go off to war with Hines and his 17 year old son, Tom, in 1861. Hines told Collier that he was just too young and they left the boy crying like his heart would break. Not to be denied, Holt stowed away on one of the seven ships transporting Mississippi volunteers to training bases. The story goes that once Holt's skills with a gun and horse were observed by no less than Nathan Bedford Forrest, Hines, who Holt always called uh, my old colonel, gave him his freedom and he was allowed to choose what unit he would join. He joined the 9th Texas Cavalry and served throughout the war. He finished the war as one of Nathan Bedford Forrest's most trusted scouts, known as a superb horseman and marksman. Holt was at the Battle of Shiloh, the Confederates called it Pittsburgh Landing, but whatever, where he received a minor ankle wound and claimed to have seen General Albert Sidney Johnson removed from his big white horse and laid under a tree where he quickly bled to death. After the war, Holt returned with his old colonel and thus began the difficult days of reconstruction. In 1866, Holt was charged, tried, but never convicting, convicted of killing an occupying Union officer. Hal Hines and a Union captain, James A. King of Company B, 49th United States Colored Troops, had a verbal, verbal confrontation that soon came to blows. The much older Hines was continually knocked down by the much younger man, who grew angrier, angrier each time. Finally, the young officer from Iowa drew a knife and started towards Hines. From a distance, a shot rang out and Captain King was no more. Holt never admitted to the killing, but he never denied it either. Legend has it, he admitted to Theodore Roosevelt during one of their hunting trips that he had indeed been the shooter. This is a photo of Quantrell's men on one of their many reunions. If you'll notice on the third row on the extreme right, the black man, that fellow's name is John Nolan. First reunion of the men who rode with William Clark Quantrell was held in September 1898 at Blue Springs, Missouri. They continued to hold annual reunions for the next 32 years until 1929. The reunions were held at various locations, including Wallace Grove, home of Mr. and Mrs. J.D. Wallace in Independence, Missouri. This is a 1906 reunion photo, was taken in Independence. Among the attendees was John Nolan, first from the right in the third row, born a slave in 1844, was John Nolan. Before William Clark Quantrell and hundreds of his Missouri guerrillas raided Lawrence in 1863. John Nolan rode ahead to scout out the town. Nolan, Quantrell's primary scout, is just one of many blacks who served in the Confederate units during the war, said historian Ed Kennedy. Nolan joined Quantrell because his family in Missouri had been abused by Jayhawkers, Kansas guerrillas who raided Missouri and later were mustered into Union forces, Kennedy said. Photographs of Quantrell's Raiders as they attended reunions after the war show Nolan sitting prominently with white members of the group. In the 1999 movie, Ride with the Devil, Nolan is the basis for the character Daniel Holt, the free black man, who along with his former owner rides with Quantrell's Raiders, Kennedy said. This comes from uh, Fold 3. Pick a cliche that you think you know about the Civil War. Louisiana will turn it into a misnomer. The slaves were running away from slavery in the Union South Louisiana that was exempted from the Emancipation Proclamation and going to North Louisiana where Governor Allen had declared an emancipation that was legal. So it, the whole thing is upside down and confused. Okay, you also had a aristocracy, a planter class that owned their own horses, slave owners, that were black. And I think this is what we're talking about here. Federal Official Records, Series 1, Volume 15, Part 1, pages 137 through 138. Pickets were thrown out that night in Captain Hennessy, Company E of the 9th Connecticut, having been sent out with his company, captured a colored rebel scout, well-mounted, 
who had been sent out to watch our movements. Now, the 9th Connecticut was sent down to try to bypass Vicksburg to up by Mississippi, and it didn't work. And that's what it's talking about down here. Uh, there, the 9th was part of Brigadier General Benjamin Butler's New England Brigade, organized for the capture of New Orleans on uh, capture of New Orleans. On July, June 25th, 1862, the unit was put to work upriver on a canal opposite Pittsburgh, along with regiments from Massachusetts, Vermont, Michigan, and Wisconsin, all under the direction of General Thomas Williams. The canal was intended to connect a loop in the Mississippi River and allow Union ships to bypass the canyons on the bluffs of Pittsburgh and have free access to the north from the north to the Gulf of Mexico. However, lack of drinking water supplies and medicine, as well as summer heat and exposure, quickly took its toll as heat stroke, malaria, and dysentery spread rapidly. With many dying or incapacitated, slaves from nearby plantations were added to the workforce. But as the water level fell in the river, the canal was the, cal, the canal attempt was abandoned on July 24th, and the troops were moved downriver to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. A boat, the Agrolane, with 300 sick on board, was left behind with Surgeon Gallagher of the 9th in charge. In a four-month span from July through October 1862, 150 men from the 9th Regiment alone died of disease. What this neglects to say is over a thousand slaves, because slavery was still legal in 62 before the emancipation was declared, they coaxed a thousand slaves to come help them work on this project, promising them freedom, which they didn't legally have the right to give them. And of course, they double-crossed them. They, when they went down to Baton Rouge, they left them all totally stranded and abandoned. Where they said that in the Civil War in Louisiana by winters, he says they just were screaming and hollering and crying on the levee there, abandoned to the tender mercies of Confederate revenge. This is a map of the Dahlgren raid. In this one, we're going to deal with Martin Robinson. He was hanging down here in the far left-hand corner at Goochland Courthouse. Of the many drawings and paintings and pictures of almost every incident of the Civil War of note, there's nothing that shows the hanging of Martin Robinson. This is an, another incident where they're about to hang a suspected traitor from a tree with a bridle rein. The bottom picture is actually what happened to Dahlgren a little bit later on that next night. He was shot from his horse and killed. Uh, it's kind of hard to feel sorry for him. Was Martin Robinson a Confederate agent? Okay, this is two uh, different reports. In most of them, they generally suspect that since he was black, he couldn't have been a Confederate spy. I don't know. I'm going to read them to you, and you can figure it out for yourself. This comes from the History Arts, Learning About and Discussing History. Dahlgren's raid on Richmond generates an ongoing controversy. On March 1st, after burning Dover Mills and outbuildings at Sabine Hill, Sabot Hill Plantation, Dal Dahlgren began searching in vain for a place to cross the James. His guide, a free African-American brick mason, Martin Robinson from Goochland, could not find a fort. Unfortunately for Robinson, the, the recent weather had raised the level of the river, making it impassable. Suspecting Robinson was misleading him, Dahlgren hung him from a tree next to the river near Tuckahoe Plantation. Okay, the Sutherland Dahlgren raid in memories, memories of things unknown by Richard Slotsberg, 2012. Lost and disoriented in hostile country, Dahlgren made a series of unfortunate moves. Gone far astray in unfamiliar country and pursued by furious avengers, he nevertheless continued firing the land already made desolate. Then there was the cruel incident of his summary, summary killing of young local man the believed that he believed had betrayed him. Free black bricklayer Martin Robinson had been recruited as a guide and was supposed to lead the Union men to a safe place to ford the mighty James. But powerful winter rains had made the, that impossible. In a pick of rage, Dahlgren had the young man hanged from a tree in the riverbank. 
both of these accounts to seem to discount the fact that he was really a Confederate spy. Now, this comes from the official records, the official report for the ranking officer that survived and submitted it for the records. A Negro had misled us during the night, and to obviate the delay of retracing our steps, Colonel Dahlgren, on the representation of the Negro that an excellent ford was to be found at Dover Mills, concluded to cross at that point. After two hours halt, we again moved on and soon reached Dover Mills but only to meet disappointment. The Negro had deceived us. No fort existed at this point, nor any means of crossing the river. He then stated that the ford was three miles below. This was obviously false, as the river was evidently navigable to and above this place as we saw a sloop going down the river. He came into our lines from Richmond and was born and always belonged to the immediate family in the immediate vicinity of Dover Mills. He was very shrewd and intelligent, and it would seem impossible that he would not know that no port existed in the neighborhood where he had seen the vessels daily passing. Colonel Dahlgren warned him that if he detected acting in bad faith or lying, he would surely hang him. And after we left over Mills and had gone down the river so far as to render further prevarication, prevarication unavailing, the Colonel charged him with betraying us destroying the whole design of the expedition and hazarding the lives of everyone engaged in it, and told him that should be, he should be hung in conformity with the terms of his service. The Negro became greatly alarmed, stated confusingly that he was mistaken, thought we intended to cross the river in boats, and finally said that he had done wrong and was sorry, etc. The colonel ordered him to be hung. A halter strap was used for that purpose, and we left the miserable wrench wench, wretch, dangling by the roadside. I mean, couldn't they just shot him? I mean, no, they had to hang him up and let him strangle slowly. That's terrible. I became acquainted with Miss Kroon on uh, Facebook. Uh, she's a fountain of information about the Confederate cavalry in Virginia. It's like she knew Jeb Stewart in a past life. She's familiar with all the staff and all his friends and girlfriends. I know quite a few writers that in my involvement with veterans organization and then at the universities. I'm not going to mention books that they've had come out recently because it would sound like I was insulting them. This one is, of course, the most powerful thing I've read in many, many years. Most important book about the Civil War to come out in a very long time. And I strongly suggest that you make arrangements to read it if you have to go to the library or read it online with Kindle. But she tells a story that hasn't been told before. And I think it's very important that y'all go look at it. I don't have any kind of a financial interest in this. In fact, I had to pay full price for my book. There's no money in this for me. This is sincere effort for people to learn about the Civil War. And this woman presents things you're not going to find anyplace else in this very important book by Leroy Wiley Gresham, a young man living in Macon, Georgia during the war. I've got three daughters and six granddaughters, and I buy enough jewelry from Mr. Dave Trent that he gives me a break on the price. Other than that, he's not paying for this. His business is Southern Santa and Rebel Moon Vendors. They sell biker jewelry, Confederate merchandise, and they go to reenactments in camps and festivals. If y'all need anything that he's got, please contact him at this number. He's a good man. He'll make you a fair deal.